All right, if you're anything like me, you hate running out of food on a trip. It's like a big fear, and so I'm I'm a big fan of snacks during an adventure, and one of my absolute favorite go-to snacks are wonderful pistachios. You may be familiar with pistachios and the brand Wonderful Pistachios, but if you're not, they are one of the highest protein nuts out there. One ounce serving of Wonderful Pistachios is six grams of protein. That's 10% of your daily value. It also includes nine essential amino acids, and they come with a ton of different flavors, varieties. There's a spicy version. There's lightly salted. There's no salted. There's so many, and every time I go on an adventure, i not even lying, I take an entire bag with me. And what's cool, too, I love having the Wonderful pistachio in shell because then that almost gives me something to do and focus on as I'm paddling or biking through the really monotonous parts of the adventure. Every great adventure is going to have plenty of boring moments and it's nice to have something to do and also something that is giving you some fuel like wonderful pistachios. So they're one of my favorite adventure snacks, favorite road trip snacks, and definitely leave me feeling better than a lot of other snacks you can turn to. So if you want to learn more about how to fuel your next adventure with wonderful pistachios, go to wonderful pistachios.com to learn more. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason. Today we're throwing it back to March 2021. I can't believe this was three years ago. I say that all the time, don't I? Uh, Christine Reed is a friend of mine. We met uh, living in Yosemite National Park 10 years ago now. And uh, we, we both were working for the park and living in these like military bunk houses, things, these canvas tents. It was it was awesome. It was a great experience. One of the coolest things in my life. And we got to know each other there and we all go our separate ways. Well, uh, Christine had done so many cool things through hike the Appalachian Trail, through hike the Wonderland Trail and, and wrote a book about her spe- experiences in backpacking, which all came from. Uh, just a Google search one day and deciding to do the Appalachian Trail. So her memoir, which came out around the time this uh, episode released, is called Alone in Wonderland. And it's a great book, has some great reviews, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. However, I do have an email in my inbox from Christine for another interview. And uh, Christine, I'm so sorry I haven't answered you yet, but I'm going to, and I believe it's going to be about your new book, which is called Blood, Sweat, and Tears, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about when I have her back on the show. So I often say, you know, we should have this person back on the show. Well, we're going to have Christine back on the show. I want to hear what's been going on since this interview, uh, what she has been up to, and uh, enjoy this conversation. I hope you uh, get a lot out of it, and I I I remember enjoying it. So let's dive in. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Mason? Doing well. So I always ask this first, where are you coming from today? I am in Denver, Colorado. Oh, cool. Is that home for you? It is now. I recently sold my van and moved into a real sticks and bricks place. How does it feel? It's good and scary and like amazing and sad all at the same time. You know, we haven't even talked about this. We just kind of jumped on the phone, but you and I have known each other or, you know, I started following you after we we met each other in Yosemite back in 2014. Was that 2014? Yeah. Holy yep. cow. And we lived in, uh, oh, Curry, Camp Curry, Curry Village is what it was yeah. called. In the, in the housing. On Frat both... Row. <laughs> Frat Row. Yeah, that's right. Oh my gosh. Holy cow. <laughs> rough, rough area. <laughs> I think I got there at the right time, though. I got there late in the season, so the party party atmosphere had had chilled out a little. I think. Yes, I had got. I, so I pulled into the valley, Yosemite Valley. It was still snowing in May up in the you know just a thousand feet above the valley. You could see it up, kind of like on Washington Column, and up on the the the, the mountain or up on the valley uh, edges, but. It was still cold, and so before the real summer had started, but I remember we got to know each other. We lived across each other from uh, just kind of across. It's like these military-style tents, everyone that's listening, and you just, you know, you get to know people because it's pretty open lifestyle. Uh, hippie living, it was awesome. And the, the story I remember about you is— Oh, no. <laughs> it was a good thing. You, you set off to climb Mount Whitney, 
Uh huh. And you know, it's like, hey, I'm gonna go climb Mount Whitney. We talked a few times, and I was like, sweet, you know, I gotta work. You know, <laughs> we worked six days a week there, which sucked because you didn't. You only had one day to explore, and really, you wanted to do that all the time. It's Yosemite, and you were gone a few days, and you came back, and you just had this 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 glow about you, this grin on your face, and you had done it. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that's a hilarious retelling perspective, though. But but you it was you said it was tough. You said you had gone with someone else that that either quit, um, that just wasn't there for the right reasons, and you and went and did it alone, and you came down, and you were just so energized and pumped. And I actually went and did one of my first backpacking trips probably a couple weekends later, just like, all right, Christine is, I've got to get some experiences in before this summer ends. And uh, I just remember that about you. That's awesome. Yeah, it was definitely the hardest thing I had ever done in my life up to that point. And probably still like top 10 hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> that is wild. And you know, I, and I don't mean to just, I typically don't just jump into a story like that. But you, you, you know, this is a little unique. We've known each other a little bit. But Gosh, that had to be just an incredible experience. I've never done it. I was never able to get to Mount Whitney. Yeah, definitely recommend. It's 22 <laughs> miles round trip. Um, and I really didn't know anything about it. And I had just moved to the valley. And a girl that I worked with went and hiked it like probably my first week uh, at the job. And she came back and told me, hey, I hiked Mount Whitney. It was so fun. And I was like, that sounds cool. Um, and I asked her a couple questions. How hard is it? And and she said, not that hard. And I didn't know at the time that she is one of these like super hiker, like just very, um, she's fast and she's strong and really fit. And I was none of those things. And so I didn't realize when she told me that it was not that hard, that it actually was really hard and that she was just <laughs> better at hiking than I was. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I got together with someone else I had just met and I was like, Hey, let's do this. And we got the permits and we drove out there and he was not prepared. Not that I was prepared. We were both unprepared. Um, but I ended up leaving him around mile five, um, cause he was getting altitude sickness and just wasn't feeling super great. And so we had all my backpacking gear with us, even though we were only planning to be there for a day. Um, cause I was like, I'm going to carry my backpacking gear and practice hiking with 40 pounds on my back. Um, up the highest mountain in the contiguous U.S. <laughs> do not recommend that idea. But <laughs> so, so, but it was good. We had all my stuff. And so we set up the tent and sleeping bag and stuff. And he slept um, while I hiked the rest of the way up and then came back down. And then I met him uh, back at mile five and we walked out together. Um, but it took me 24 hours from car to car, which hopefully won't take other people who are more experienced that long, but it was something I needed to do to prove to myself because I was getting ready to hike the AT. That's actually why I moved to Yosemite was to get some hiking experience and hang out with other people in the outdoor community. And I didn't really have much hiking experience at all. And so when I got on Mount Whitney and I realized I'd kind of gotten myself into a fix, I thought I have to do this. I have to finish this to prove that I can to myself because I'm about to go out and hike, you know, thousands of miles on the Appalachian Trail. That's what I was planning on doing. And so I felt like if I if I quit on Mount Whitney, then how would I know that I was capable of going out on the Appalachian Trail just a few months later? Did it help? It did, definitely. And it's something I still look back on when I'm doing something difficult. Like I ran rim to rim in the Grand Canyon um, last year. And you know, when I was close to the end and you're climbing up out of the canyon and, and I was just thinking like, this is so hard. Like, am I ever going to make it? And I thought if I could make it to the top of Mount Whitney, like I can finish this day, you know? That is awesome. That is so cool. Just to, to have the experience, um, to test yourself initially, knowing a, a much larger test is coming. But, you know, I, I, I really didn't know those plans at the time, but I just remember that and you getting and it was, just, you know, a, a day or two had gone by and I saw you again and we had all just been, you know, groveling around doing our little jobs, working in the <laughs> campground. And you're just like this changed person, like you, Moses up at Mount Sinai coming down. It was like, wow, tell us your wisdom, Christine. It was awesome. I think that glow was uh, a sunburn, right? Because you yes, get a lot you of were, sun you were exposure at 14,000 sure. feet. Skin cancer like grows on you up there. It's just it's just brutal the UV rays. But uh, 
So, so really that, you know, folks, that's really our introduction to each other and, uh, really, you know, started following you. We all moved out of the Valley for, you know, whatever reason I, I actually left the Valley and got married that like left the Valley, met my girlfriend in Vegas and we eloped right then and there and then moved to Denver for six years. Well, if you don't mind, you know, this is definitely not typical, uh, to, to jump right into something like that, but I'd love to know a little bit about, um, before we get into like the AT and what happened after that, just kind of where you grew up. Cause I, you, you mentioned something in another interview I listened to is that you're from a family of, uh, indoorsy people, which I've never really heard someone describe their family like that. And I'd love to hear like what was growing up like and, and where did you grow up? Yeah, totally. Um, my dad was in the military, so we moved around quite a bit. I actually lived several years in Florida as a child and then moved to Northern California, just north of San Francisco for high school. And then after after I finished school, uh, my family was moving to Arkansas and I was starting college as a 17-year-old. So it seemed prudent to stay living at home for a little while. And so I moved to Arkansas and went to college there. Um, but I would say like, my parents were just super focused on academic achievement and it was something I excelled at from a really young age. And so, you know, I did the thing I was good at and I got a lot of praise for it. And so it was really easy to just kind of stay in that cycle and running and sports and PE and all of those things were just like abject torture to me. Uh, <laughs> and so I remember, you know, even as young as six, seven years old, I remember being the only kid who couldn't catch anyone playing tag. And the only person when my class was playing soccer at recess, that was just like 20 or 30 feet behind everybody else. And then by the time they got turned around and were running the other way, like I couldn't even get turned around and like catch up to them, um, as they were passing me by. <laughs> so, you know, my parents were big readers and not into outdoorsy stuff. And I had kind of negative experiences with lots of different physical activities as a kid. And so it just kind of was off my radar at a certain point. I, I had things that I enjoyed and was good at and, and it didn't seem important to me to, to try to do something that was so hard. Mm. And until later in life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't really discover hiking until I was in my twenties. Um, and it was a few times other people said like, Hey, let's go hike this or that. And I had a few like pretty bad experiences going out with friends and hiking. And then I kind of just was like putting that in the brain bank of like, okay, hiking's not really my thing. And then I guess at, right after college, I happened upon a blog about the AT online while I was feeling a bit adrift, having just graduated and I was working this job in health insurance and I didn't really know what I was planning on doing with my life and had gotten to a point where goals weren't being set for me anymore. Cause I think, you know, from a young age in school, it's always get good grades and go to the next thing and then go to college and figure out a major. And so you kind of have these like pre-written rules that you're following along. And then when you graduate from college, there's just sort of an abyss that happens after that. And I kind of found myself there treading water, feeling lost. And, and then I found this blog about the AT and it seemed like a lot of people who were getting into through hiking and, and blogging about it, were talking about that feeling of lost just not knowing what you're doing. And I really identified with that. And it looked like these people had that same problem I had, and then they found a solution and it was the Appalachian Trail. And I thought maybe that solution would work for me too. You, you, you mentioned, I heard you also mentioned that people, they go hiking. It, it's typically not just to hike. There's something else going on. Um, and that, that seems like it was the case for you. Could you, could you talk about that? What, what it was for you that made, made you want to get out there? Definitely. Yeah. I think, um, lots of people who enjoy hiking go on day hikes, but, um, to, to commit to something like a big through hike, there's gotta be a bigger reason than just like, I enjoy hiking. <laughs> um, and I think that I had that feeling of loss and also a feeling of, like, I was just not sure who I was. Um, and I thought this could be like the adventure of a lifetime. You know, I'm in my early 20s and I just want to figure out who I am. And I thought maybe going out and, and kind of simplifying life and spending time away from all the people who I had built my life around to just really be able to inquire within um, 
sometimes it helps to shock the system and and go somewhere where you don't know anyone and do something that you don't know how to do. And, and that helps you figure out like what you're really capable of. I think that was a big part of it for me was kind of pushing that boundary of like, this is something I know that is hard because I've been on a couple of hikes and it's hard. Um, but it's something I think I'm capable of if, but it's going to be a lot of work. And so it was a level of wanting to get to know something about myself and also push and test myself in a way that I had never done before. So to get ready for the AT, you, you, you take this job in Yosemite Valley, have all these incredible experiences, and, and then the real test came. You, you, as it got closer, when, when were you kind of getting ready or, or going on your Appalachian Trail experience? What, 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 was, what was that like? You know what I'm saying? Like you went to Yosemite, it finished, what, in this fall, and then the next spring you were going to start the AT? Yeah, so I actually moved to Yosemite in August of 2014. 14 and I stayed there until January. So I was there oh, through most of the, the winter. winter season. Yeah, because I had the only reason I picked Yosemite is because I my lease was going to be up at the place I was staying in Arkansas. And I thought, I don't really want to sign a six month lease. So I googled what kind of jobs uh, provide housing. And the first thing that came up was national parks. And I was like, Oh, perfect. Like, that's exactly in line with what I'm doing. Like, sounds great. So I applied for a job in Yosemite. Um, it's pretty easy to get a job there at the end of the season because they're still busy for another couple of months after all the people who are there working summer jobs leave. And so I applied, got a job right away and then showed up August 11th and then was there through January. And then I was planning on starting the AT on March 20th. So I left the first week of January, like drove back to Arkansas to my parents' place and I was spending about six to eight weeks kind of just getting everything ready for the AT. So I was packing boxes with food. Um, I was buying last minute gear things, uh, just spending time with my parents, which was nice. And then kind of helping them get ready for me to be gone because they were going to be shipping everything and taking care of my logistics a little bit. So I was just doing all the prep work. But one of the things that I say about the AT is like, I did a lot of preparing when it came to logistics. I did a lot of preparing when it came to the mentality of like understanding I was going to do something difficult. Um, but I didn't do a lot of preparing when it came to hiking. Other than hiking Mount Whitney, that was pretty much it. Like <laughs> I went on a couple other day hikes um, in Yosemite when I was there. And then I didn't hike in Arkansas before I left because it was too cold. And so I just really didn't physically prepare a whole lot. Um, but one of the things that's really great about long distance hiking is you have plenty of time to like get in shape as you go. So when I stepped on the trail, um, at the end of March, I probably was not as prepared as I should have been, but I just took it really easy for the first couple weeks of like seven, eight, nine mile days, um, and getting used to carrying my backpack. Cause I really didn't have much experience with that and, and just getting used to what it feels like to like walk for pretty much your only activity during the day. What was that like? What did it feel like to, to actually be out there after all this preparation, you know, as far as thinking about it so long, maybe not the actual hiking, but, um, and then having it on your back, having all the gear and stepping on the trail saying, this is my life now. What did that feel like? <laughs> Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. There was definitely an aspect of like very surreal, like, okay, this is the thing I've been planning to do for, it was over a year that I had had decided I had was going to do that. And so to get out there and like put the backpack on for the first time and you're like, oh, this is really heavy. <laughs> um, and the approach trail for the AT is... Uh, goes from Amicalola State Falls Park. And the first section of it is just a huge staircase that follows up alongside a waterfall. And I'm like grueling my way up this staircase and it's humid and there's water splashing from the waterfall. And, you know, I'm looking around and there's tons of people day hiking and just like going up to the falls because it's a state park. And I'm like looking at all of them. And then I'm thinking about myself just like sweating with this backpack on. And I'm like, I look disgusting. And <laughs> Like, these people are probably thinking that girl's never going to make it. Right, this is like 300 <laughs> yards in. <laughs> you know, I definitely had like an, oh, sh what have I gotten myself into? 
moment. Um, but then once I was past that first stretch of like stairs, then there's a little bit of a flat section. I was like, okay, I can do this. I made it up that staircase. I climbed Mount Whitney. Like I can hike, you know, this trail. Wow. That is too cool. I mean, I, I've I've done that. I've done the part of the AT from the from the southern terminus to like the North Carolina border. Uh huh. And, and I did it in winter on Christmas break um, from Yikes. college, and it sucked. It was my only backpacking experience at the time, and my well, first experience. Let's put it that way. And you know, yeah, I thought the same thing. That first climb up up that waterfall, I was like, people do this for twenty. <laughs> 22, 2,600 miles. This is ridiculous. I, I, I can totally feel like, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? So ultimately, you you didn't complete the trail, but you did what, 25% or so, a, a, quite a bit of the trail. What ultimately took you off? Um, I, yeah, I started at the end of March. A few days after I got on the trail, I was only probably about 30 miles in. My mom died. Um, she had been sick with cancer, but we weren't expecting her to die, um, at that time. And so I actually left the trail then for 10 days, I went home and, and we had the memorial service and I saw all the family and, you know, spent some time with my dad. And, and when I got the call, I thought, oh, this is the end of this. Like I've been out here for three days and my trip is over. Um, and I was pretty upset about that, but I thought I have familial obligations. I need to go home and deal with this now. And so I was, I was prepared for that to be the end of my trip. Um, but then I got home and some people in my family asked me, when are you going back out on the trail? And at first I was kind of offended by the question. I thought, how could I do that? That's not like the right thing to do. Um, but after just a few days of spending time with my dad, I realized like me being there wasn't helping him at all. And I didn't feel like I needed to be there for my own sake. I felt like I kind of needed to get back. Like there was a reason I was going out on the AT to begin with. And that reason didn't just disappear because my mom died. Um, and so I ended up going back out and hiking from where I had left off to, uh, Parisburg, Virginia, and I got off the trail just a little after that. So it was about 650 miles. Um, and and I when I left the trail and came back, I told myself, like, the goal is no longer, it's not about making it to Maine anymore. Um, it became more about just trying to do the soul searching and find the answers to the questions I had gone out there for. And I thought, when I feel like I finished what I came here for, then I'll go home. And so... I had a moment in Parisburg, Virginia, where I thought, do I still need to be here? And I actually hiked about, I think, 14 miles out of Parisburg that day. And I got picked up um, from a campsite just the next day out of Parisburg. So when I was in Parisburg, I thought maybe it's time to go home. And throughout that day, I thought about it and I decided that it was time. So I called a friend who arranged a ride for me. Mm, that's heavy. That's tough. I, I've heard we've had a lot of people on this show that haven't completed like, you know, the full whatever through hike or trailer, whatever it is for them, uh, the coast to coast ride. And, you know, we've we've heard a lot of folks say, you know, they've done a lot completed other things. But for some reason, you know, you, the, the trail is not it's not about you know, doing what everyone says you're supposed to do. It's really about you're out there for the reasons you're out there for. And if you feel like those things get resolved or you get those answers you're looking for, uh, then the trail has done its job. You know, the trail has served its purpose and you have you have experienced it. You know, um, we've had so, so many people that said, you know, I got to this point on on the route where I felt at peace that I that, that I felt what I, I found what I was looking for, essentially. And uh, there's no, you know, it's arbitrary if you make it to the end or not in that sense. Totally. I mean, I went out there to prove something to myself about who I was and what I was capable of. And I didn't need to hike 2,186 miles to get that. You know, I got to 650 and I thought, I've done something really difficult. And I feel very sure of who I am in this experience that I don't need to keep walking. So from that point, uh, you know, that that's such a big goal in so many people's lives, doing a through hike or uh, you know, an adventure in general, it can be just consume you, like you said, for a year. What 
filled that void after getting off the Appalachian Trail? And where did your life start to go from there? Oh, that's a, an interesting question. I think a lot of people talk about post-trail depression because we get mm. this, yeah, um, we get this this sense of who we are and what life is about when we're on the trail. And, you know, a lot of people come off very minimalist and, you know, I just really realized the things I didn't, didn't need and what was important. And all of those things were true. Definitely for me. Um, I came back after the AT, I went back to my dad's place and I actually spent three months there with him. Um, and we really just hung out every day and, I watched TV together and like bonded in a way. And That's I was, cool. I was 25 years old. Yeah. It was really nice to have the freedom to do that, honestly. Um, because at my age, like I think a lot of women in their teenage years and early twenties, you kind of pull away from your parents and you want to establish your own identity. And there's a little bit of like pushing away, um, that we do to the people who are closest to us because we want to prove we don't need them in the way that we did as children. And it was a good opportunity for me to go then kind of mend that relationship with my dad. And, and now we, you know, we don't have my mom anymore. And she was always kind of the center of our family, I felt. And so for us to build our own relationship without her there, I think was, it was a nice experience. And I was really happy that I had the time to do that. And that was, you know, the time I would have been on the trail if I had stayed So for me, like giving up that time on the trail to do that with my dad was really great. Um, But then after a while, I was like, okay, I have to go now. (laughs) Um, So I moved to Denver at that point in 2016. Um, Or I guess that was the end of 2015. And I was like, okay, I took a year off. I worked this job in the national park. I need to get my resume back together now that I've taken all these detours. And so I got a job and was living in a condo and did the kind of just like regular thing for a while. And I started to get that same feeling of just like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life and feeling very antsy and kind of trapped by the lifestyle that I had built in Denver. And so I took a job opportunity in Arizona and shortly thereafter, I purchased my first van. And then very quickly after purchasing the van, I quit my job and moved into the van, which was not built at all. It was just a van. (laughs) Um, And I started living in it. And so that was in the spring of 2018. And I've lived full time in a van since then until just about a month ago. Oh my gosh. Uh, (laughs) Full time in the van for until the month ago. We're catching you at a really interesting time then. So I remember seeing your, your posts about the van, building it out. Uh, you you would write essentially in your posts, you know, you, you almost like um, just talking about things in your life. And it wasn't, you know, just details about like the van is, you know, this old and has this many miles. It was just like the why of everything. And it was just very interesting to read that stuff. And, and, it, and it was cool to see those updates from you. Um, tell us about van life. What what did you do during those few years? And, and what, what kind of... Uh, did it fulfill you or did it, did it still leave some sort of void? Um, I'm still working through some of those feelings, yeah. <laughs> um, but definitely I was, I was feeling a little bit of the same thing I felt about the AT. And so I think I was looking for another kind of escape from the reality I had built. And I was looking for a way to get out and explore and, and do a little bit more searching within myself. And so when I bought the first van, I took it, kind of like the big trip that first year was like up through California into Oregon and Washington. And I had never been to the Pacific Northwest before. So I wanted to just go up there and I'd heard how great Oregon was. And so I was just like, I'm going to go explore. And I had a few issues, like one of which was I didn't really know what I was trying to accomplish. I was just wandering. And so I spent a lot of time alone and I spent a lot of time like feeling of very alone. Um, I was very much like Mm. in my feels about lack of community and lack of partnership. And, you know, my dating life had been kind of a mess. And so this was a bit of a like run away from that situation. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll like meet a cool van person and we'll like hang out and do van things together. But you really have to look for those um, connections. And I wasn't doing that in any way. I was just like hoping it would happen to me magically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) You know, just like anything in life. Yeah, yeah. There's, I, 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 I quote made a friend the other day and it was legitimately looking up this hashtag on Instagram. 
finding someone with the same interests in our area and just reaching out to them like, hey, we should be friends. And they're like, I agree. Let's meet together. And it was, <laughs> is this really what friendship is now? <laughs> and we're both laughing about it because that's that's just kind of how you have to do it almost when you're when you become an adult, it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, COVID obviously has exacerbated that, but living in a van, it was like, it's really easy when you have, it's like a turtle shell. Like you can just go from place to place and then crawl into your shell and like be alone. And it's really easy to not let people in. Wow. Um, and so I had gone up through California. I spent probably four or five weeks in Portland and I just kind of was having a hard time leaving Portland. Um, even though I wasn't having a good time, I was just, I felt like, Oh, if I'm going to go somewhere else, I need to like do something when I get there. And so I was feeling this, like, where should I go? What should I be doing? I had a lot of questions. And then a good friend of mine, actually the same person who told me Mount Whitney was not that hard. Um, she called and said, Hey, I'm going to Mount Rainier to do a day hike. Do you want to come? And yeah, I said, it's not that hard. <laughs> yeah. She said, Oh, it's not that hard. No, <laughs> we weren't summoning Mount Rainier. So <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's I hear it stuff. <laughs> so I said, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for calling me and like giving me some out to like go do something. Um, and so we met at Mount Rainier a couple days later and we hiked just like a couple miles day hike. Um, and on that hike, we crossed paths with the Wonderland Trail. And I thought, oh, I've heard of that because I belong to all these hiking groups on Facebook and I'm sure somebody's mentioned it on there. So mm -hmm. I thought, let me Google that really quick. And I like Googled and it's like a hundred mile trail around Mount Rainier. And I was like, I'm doing that. That's what I'm going to do. Um, so I went to Seattle with her to visit one of her friends for a day or two. And I got food and stuff ready to go. And I went and applied for a walk-up permit for Mount Rainier um, to do the Waterland Trail, not to summit Mount Rainier. Um, and so that was, <laughs> that was about six months into van life. And I think at that point I was feeling pretty, disenchanted with the whole van experience because I thought it was going to be some kind of answer to life's questions and this like great carefree way to travel and have fun and meet people. And, and I just like wasn't having any of those experiences. And so when I saw the opportunity to do a backpacking trip, I thought, maybe that is the thing that I'm really needing because that on the AT is what helped me get to this point now, right? It was something that had been the answer in the past. And I saw it and I thought, oh, maybe backpacking is the answer again. Maybe I messed up with this whole van life thing. And and what I really should be doing is backpacking. Wow. Yeah. I mean, maybe it felt a little like reaching in a bunch of different directions, but I, I, I saw something familiar there that had been comfort to me in the past. Tell us about doing the Wonderland Trail because it's, you know, it's a little shorter than the AT. It, you know, it's a permitted trail. So there's more of this kind of unique, more of a alone experience. And it's obviously completely unbelievably stunning. What what was the, the experience of, of hiking that trail around Mount Rainier? It was one of the best hiking experiences I've had. It's I would highly, highly recommend to anyone who can get a permit to do the Wonderland Trail. Um, it is very heavily permitted. There's limited camping. And so there aren't the same crowds that you experience on a trail like the AT. Um, it's very much like these five people are camping at this campsite tonight. So those are the five people you might see today while you're hiking, which is a cool, it's a cool experience. It's nice to be out and there's times that you're walking alone and you really do feel feel alone. Um, and that's not an experience I got much on the AT, <laughs> but it is also, there's comfort in knowing like you're in a national park, there are rangers out and about, there are other people hiking, even if you don't see them, um, that day, you kind of know these campsites are all booked. So there's definitely at least five people out here. <laughs> five other people to rely on. That's, that's pretty cool. Yes. So, so you know, because because your book, we haven't talked about your book yet, but it's called Alone in Wonderland. It, it is was there something different about that experience of that ninety something mile trail around Mount Rainier that was just different than the other experiences you've had? Something did you, did you learn something unique, or was it just this combination of of, of points you were in in life that really that it, why it really gripped you? I think that the main thing that was different 
on the Wonderland Trail for me personally was that when I talked to other people on the trail, I really felt like a lot of people were in the same place and experiencing some of the th same things that I was. And I think on the AT, that was also true, but I wasn't processing it that way because I had just lost, lost my mom. And so I was dealing very much with like that grief and that experience. And I didn't meet a whole lot of other people on the AT who I felt like understood what I was going through. But I was in such a different place in my life when I got on the Wonderland Trail. The thing that I was dealing with was this feeling of isolation and a feeling of like seeking connection and seeking connection with other people, but also with the earth and with myself as a hiker and who I was. And I was really searching for something that like only the trail can give you. And I think the other people that I met there, you know, I talked to a lot of other people on my hike and a lot of them, I felt like we're feeling a lot of the same feelings. And one of the things that's really nice about being in a community, especially like the backpacking community, when you're out on a long trail is there's a level of vulnerability just from being out, you know, unprotected with nothing but your pack and sleeping in the woods and, and meeting strangers and the community that we have out there allows for a level of vulnerability that we don't often display in our regular lives. And so you're able to walk up to people and, and talk about like real stuff <laughs> um, in a way that we just don't usually do. And so I think what, what kind of inspired me to write the book was the conversations I had on the trail along the way and just the openness of the other hikers. And I realized, you know, these things that are going through my head all day, every day that are making me like wonder what my purpose is and and who I am and and these doubts that I'm experiencing and the isolation like I'm not the only person experiencing those things. Did you feel like you were before that? I think yeah, I think we all have a sense of like our unique struggle. <laughs> like, you know, we all think the things that are hard in our lives are personally ours. Um and I definitely was experiencing that before I got on the trail, I was feeling like, why doesn't anyone want to be around me? Why am I alone? You know, why can't I find somebody to like do these things with? And I think like a lot of us are experiencing those feelings and we don't talk about them. And so I really wanted to write about my inner experience and then also my experience on the trail and how I came to kind of came to terms um, with the idea that like, I'm not the only person experiencing these feelings. I don't know who said it, but there's this, there's this, might have been Plato or Aristotle. It's one of those, one of those old dudes. And uh, they were, they were saying, you know, if we knew, if, if everyone, they, they were convinced that if everyone was in a circle and put their problems and their struggles and everything like before their feet to trade with someone else in the circle, he said, I, I'm convinced everyone would look around and say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize all of that was going on with them. I'll, I'll just happily take my struggles back and deal with them because they're <laughs> like, you think, you really do think you are the only person. I, I, we're going through, uh, uh, you know, this season with challenges, I just like every season, but there's these things that I didn't foresee with moving here that were going to be challenging. And the moment you start talking to someone else about it, the moment you realize, oh, they're experiencing the exact same thing. Oh, they are too. Oh, they are too. Really, no one is not experiencing it, but it's just so easy to feel alone in some of these struggles, you know? Yeah. And and we have this shame around admitting that we have fear and doubt and problems, and we want to like hide all that and keep it covered up. <laughs> um but the, yeah, as soon as you say it out loud, like there's such a freedom that comes with like showing your wounds and like the vulnerability we think of as a weakness, but it's such a strength to just say like, this is what's going on in my head and it's making me feel like a crazy person. And like right. ever, everyone else gets it. I've never had somebody say to me, I can't believe you're thinking that. That's silly. Right. right. <laughs> Why do you think going outdoors for you or going hiking or or, or being out there is it draws it out is it a comfort in some way like what what is it for you that draws you outdoors I think it's the reality of it like we live in these houses and we go to these jobs and we do you know we do all these things that like aren't 
real in a way. They're just things that we do in our culture. (laughs) And when you go outside, there's such a sense of like, this is where my body was meant to be. Like, this is where my heart is meant to be. Like, I can see other beings, trees and like little animals and things that are like living their truest life. And like, I want to be out there living my truest life also. Hmm. It's real. It, it's like everything out there is is uh, is doing exactly what it was supposed to do or what it is supposed to do. And when you're out there, you're yeah, kind of, you're kind of doing that, too. You feel like you're closer to it, at least. Yeah. And not like the supposed to like obligations, but like supposed to just like purpose. Right. What, what else can you tell folks about the book? Uh, what can they expect reading it? Um, and, and also, where can they find it? Yeah, so it is a memoir of my hike on the Wonderland Trail, but it is also um, kind of a narrative of like the 10 years leading up to it. And it's really, it's a personal story, but I think that one of the main things I wanted to do with writing it was to share my personal story because it is so much the same as everyone else's personal story. So I think one of the best things I've heard feedback wise about the book is just how much people relate. Um, and how much reading it, they're thinking like, oh, I I think that too. Oh, that's me too. (laughs) Um, And that's been such a great experience. So I hope that everyone who reads it sees a little bit of themselves um, in the story. And to get the book, it is available on aloneinwonderland.com, which is my personal website. If you want an autographed copy of the book, that is the only place to get one. Um, If you want to order it somewhere else, it's also available on IndieBound and Bookshop, so you can support your local bookstore. Um, If you are international, it's available on Book Depository, um, and they ship worldwide free, I think, other than England right now because of Brexit. (laughs) Say is that I am on Instagram at Rugged Outdoors Woman, um, and I'm very accessible there. So if you want to chat with me, that's where to find me. That's really awesome. Well, well, now that you're kind of settled in a in, in one spot for a little while, at least, what is uh, what's next for you? Oh, well, I'm working on another book already, but I'm also planning to hike the Colorado Trail this year, which I'm pretty excited about. Oh, awesome! I did that by a bike back in 2015. Oh, it's nice cycling, but that was oh my gosh, it was so hard. I'd much rather hike it, <laughs> much rather hike it, and that's this summer. Uh, hopefully in August. Oh, cool. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, sweet. Well, Christine, this was so so great to catch up with you after, geez, six years, seven years. Crazy. I can't believe that much time has gone by. Oh, my gosh. I know. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. You know, I'll talk to you yeah. soon. Cool. All right. See you. Bye. First of all, Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.